Jesus that we are facing today is not the one you're all thinking of. It may be a great crisis, but it's dealing with the physical, with the temporal, the one we're facing now. The greatest crisis known to humanity would be a crisis of not understanding what God requires for heaven. It's far greater because it has to do with eternal life, not the temporal. And so many people, maybe most people, I don't want to say that, but so many people don't know what God requires to gain heaven. It's a crisis of thought. It's a crisis of thinking according to Jesus. What does God require for us to gain heaven? And likewise, how does Jesus relate to that requirement of God? So what we'll do this morning is we'll hear from Jesus crucially and critically because Jesus thinks it's a crisis of thought and yet Jesus graciously steps in and helps us to think rightly about what God requires and how Jesus relates. So if you have a Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 5. We're looking at the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus addresses this crisis of thought that has to do with heaven and hell ultimately. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to look at verses 17 to 20 in just a moment, but as you're turning there and acclimating yourself, uh, what's going on here in the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus is addressing the disciples. They're his immediate audience. We learn that in chapter 5, and yet in chapter 7, we're going to learn at the end, not only is Jesus addressing his disciples, he's addressing the masses. And so, tons of people are hearing him, unbelievers are hearing him and being informed, and yet the close-knit group, the disciples, are listening. Sermon on the Mount is um, similar in a lot of ways to another great mountaintop experience uh, with God giving the law to Moses. There's a parallel. There's similarities. There are differences. Um, we won't get into all of those right now, but they're, uh, just think in terms of Moses was a mediator. He was a good mediator sometimes and a rotten mediator other times. God gave his authoritative instruction to Moses. Well, Jesus is the ultimate mediator, the ultimate faithful mediator, and not only does he give instruction from God, he doesn't have to say, thus saith the Lord God Almighty. He says, I say to you. So there is similarity, there is difference. That's about all I'll say about it this morning. Let's go ahead and read verses 17 to 20 together, and then we'll look closer. Quoting Jesus, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So as we take a deeper dive, as I like to say, what we'll do is we'll be able to highlight six clarifying facts about Jesus, six clarifying facts about Jesus that address the crisis of thought, the crisis of confusing thought about what God requires for heaven as it relates to Jesus. It's a great text. I'm excited about the text, motivated to have us learn from the text. It may unsettle some of what you've heard before. Maybe what you've heard before is right and I'm wrong. We'll let the Holy Spirit decide hopefully in your life, um, but I've hopefully read and studied enough to know the different views and I'll do my best to confuse you. Con confuse you. I'll do my best to confuse you about those bad views and bring clarity when it comes to what I think Jesus intends in context. Again, it's a crucial matter because it has to do with heaven or no heaven. The first clarifying fact about Jesus that addresses the crisis of confusion, the thought confusion, is number one, Jesus is concerned with wrong thinking. Jesus is concerned with wrong thinking. 
Yes, behavior is important. Jesus cares about behavior. We'll deal with that in other places. But here, it's not okay to try to do the right thing and be all confused in the way you think about things. Jesus goes for action here of thought. Look there again with me, if you would, in verse 17. Do not think. Do not think. That's where I've gotten my idea. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Do not think for one moment or stop thinking if you're thinking the wrong way is the idea. We don't quite have it in our English translation, uh, but there's actually a play on words between the word for thought and law. They're very similar. They sound similar. So if we were hearing this spoken in Greek or reading the Greek text, it would be law, namas, namas, Thinking namidzo, namas, namidzo, you can even hear as me, as I say them, they sound similar. You don't really need to know that other than that helps us to see that Jesus is emphasizing the idea of right thinking about law. So we, we can understand that's why some Greek scholars today would say the idea is don't think for one moment. Perish the thought. You've got to think the right way about how I, Jesus, relate to the law. And we're going to get into matters of how that relates to eternal life. It's critical that we not be errant in our thinking here. Wrong thinking about Jesus and his relationship to the law as it would relate to us ultimately is a problem. Jesus thinks it's a problem. I think it's a problem. But I think it's a problem because he thinks it's a problem. And I'm trying to convince you that you should think it's a problem. We've got to think rightly about what God requires, his law, his requirements, as it would relate to Jesus and in a little while as it would relate to us. Because he's going to be talking about heaven or no heaven. The law and the prophets, that's shorthand for the whole Old Testament. All of the books of the Old Testament, law and prophets. People with more letters behind their name than I have have concluded that there are 613 commandments in the first five books, in the Pentateuch, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, lots of commands uh, in the law, 248 positive, 365 negative. Last time I checked, I've never checked. But taking others' words for it, the idea is there's a, there are a whole lot of obligations in the first five books. But not only are all of the obligations of God's law in the first five books, we also have the prophets, the, the rest of the Old Testament. All that it says is something Jesus wants us to think rightly about, not think wrongly about. Now my question for you is, why, why might this be a problem? Why might this be something that Jesus has to say, get this right in your thinking, you're prone to think wrongly about this? Well, probably because of accusations that religious leaders who are going to be jealous are going to, 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 to throw at Jesus and his followers. They're going to accuse Jesus of being anti-Old Testament, anti-law, therefore anti-God, anti-sacred tradition, whatever it might be. And Jesus is saying, I want you to think rightly about this. Don't think the wrong way, regardless of what Rabbi so-and-so says. Regardless of what you might already be thinking, let's be thinking rightly about this. Another reason why Jesus might have to issue this warning is because there's going to be confusion about grace. There's going to be confusion about salvation. I like to remind you again and again, and I'll do it again today, when you're studying through Matthew's gospel account, don't lose sight of the big picture when we're looking at the details. R remember, clear back in chapter one, we have an interpretive key as to how to understand the whole book, and it's when Jesus is named so I'll keep going back to that touchstone, keep going back to home base, the touchstone where we, we get our bearings and we, we reacclimate ourselves. You shall name him Jesus, chapter 1, verse 21. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. Name him Jesus because he will save, okay? So if he saves, you could wrongfully think that the Old Testament and all of its requirements are, are meaningless, are insignificant, are of no point, of no value, because after all, Jesus saves. We've come to say he saves by grace alone, through faith alone, because of his finished work alone. And that's right, a right way to think, but does that mean 
Jesus is water and the Old Testament is oil? That would be wrong thinking, but it, it's kind of common thinking. I don't want to get too far off the beaten path, so if you'd like to take a little short nap, you can do that. Um, if you're a little slow on the uptake, we'll just let you take a nap. But for all of you who, ha who can think, I'm shaming you into this, but just as a little bit of an aside, this is even common today for, for even Christians, because of bad Bible teaching or lack of Bible teaching, to think, you know, oil and water, Old Testament versus Jesus, law versus Jesus, they, they don't relate in any way. Jesus is kind of anti-law. And it comes from, oh, misquoting Bible passages, uh, even books labeled after these misquoted Bible passages like uh, Romans chapter 6, for example, which, by the way, I want to go on record and say everything in Romans 6 is true. I agree with everything in Romans 6, including the quote I'm about ready to quote. But I don't agree with wrongfully using it to create confusion, to, to create this oil and water kind of thing. You probably know the text, Romans 6, where it says, we're not under law, we're under grace. Again, that's true. We're not under law, we're under grace. But too many people have hijacked that and created whole theological systems. I'm looking at you, followers of Lewis Berry Chafer, and created this system where somehow Jesus and law are not related. And so therefore, Christians and law are not related, and that's not true. Now again, I've gone too far off the beaten path, but in Romans chapter 6, where he says, you're not under law, under grace, that's verse 14 and following, there's a context, and the context is, and here's where we're kind of in the weeds. You're not under law for justification because you're trusting in Christ for justification, okay? You're declared righteous. You're declared a law keeper by grace through faith in Christ. That's Romans 1 to 5. You're no longer under law for justification. You're under grace for justification, but what's interesting in Romans 6, he goes on to give him all these legal explanations as to how you want to obey God and how you want to follow God. But I digress. But I'm using it as an example of today, misquoted Bible verses out of context, and we think, yeah, law bad. We could do it caveman style. Law bad. Jesus good. That's bad thinking. That's a crisis of thought as it would relate to what God requires. Okay, we're going to end up thinking dumb things like God requires nothing for heaven. Perish the thought. He requires, we're going to see, perfect, perpetual righteousness. That's why we're going to have to not look to ourselves. We're going to have to look to Christ to provide that so he can save us from our sins. So it is an issue, and it still is an issue. People don't understand that, that Jesus is not against the law. He's going to fulfill the law, but it needs to be intact. Let's move on to a second clarifying fact about Jesus that addresses the crisis of confusion, confusion of thought, and that is this. Number two, Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Verse 17 goes on to say, if you look there with me, you'll see, I have not come to abolish them, law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but positively look, but to fulfill them. I've come to fulfill them. He, he fulfills the Old Testament. First thing I noticed, I hope you kind of noticed, or I hope you noticed, is the authority. I have come to do this. That, that, that's a statement of authority. That's, uh, it reminds me of, I've been sent by God to do this. It's why I'm on planet Earth to, to do this. It's a, as one commentator said, it's a consciousness of mission. The very reason I'm here is to do this. Not to abolish or get rid of or downplay. No, I am on planet earth to fulfill God's Old Testament. Another thing it would be attitude we could underline. So not only the authority that's brought out there, but the attitude that's brought out. Not a negative approach, but a very positive approach to the Old Testament. Again, not law bad. Jesus good. No, law is good. He's positive, but he's going to fulfill it. Next question for you. What do, what do we mean? What, is, what, what do we think Jesus means by, I didn't come to get rid of it, I didn't come to abolish it, to render it null and void, to, to, to throw it to the scrap heap. I came to fulfill it. And I think I'll answer that in two ways. He fulfills it in two different ways. 
I would be in agreement with the notes in the, the Reformation Study Bible when it comes to the twofold way he fulfills it. First of all, when it comes to requirements, he fulfills the requirements. Then we're going to see he, he fulfills it, it, its purposes. But he fulfills the requirements of the Old Testament law and all that it requires, all of its commands. The obligation to do this, to do what's right, to obey God perfectly and perpetually, Jesus shows up on the scene and Jesus does it all. Jesus, Jesus does it perfectly. As Galatians would say, he was born under the law, born of a woman, born under the law. It's ultimately to fulfill the law. Even if we think back in our minds to chapter three, when, when God through John the Baptist was requiring people to do something, we would call John the Baptist like the, the last of the Old Testament prophets. And Jesus says, I'm going to do the right thing on behalf of the people I'm paraphrasing to fulfill all righteousness, to fulfill all legal obligations. I'm going to obey perfectly on behalf of those I represent. He fulfills the requirements. That's what makes him the savior. He can be the one who can save. He's the faithful son. He's the last Adam, as the apostle Paul would say. He can meet the obligation. He's not the, the sometimes questionable Moses. No, he's the faithful, perfect mediator. So he's going to fulfill, not get rid of as far as its requirements, but also its purposes. That's the second aspect of fulfillment. When you read the Old Testament law and prophets and you go through the 39 books, Jesus is claiming, I fulfill. So the, the second aspect is I fulfill its story. I fulfill its significance. I fulfill the narrative. I fulfill its purposes is the word I'm looking for. He brings it to its destined end, in other words. Old covenant even in the old covenant, it talks about someday a day will come, there's a new covenant. And Jesus, through his blood, new covenant. So all of the old covenant obligations fulfilled through him, the mediator of the new and better covenant. What, what, a, what a profound claim Jesus is making. He's the everlasting priest. So in Leviticus, it's high priests and they keep dying and they keep dying and they keep dying and they have to keep doing sacrifices. That's in Leviticus. But in Hebrews, the eternal everlasting high priest who sits down because his work is done. So all of this anticipation, Jesus is on the scene saying, I'm going to fulfill all of that. So we've got Passover lamb and Passover lamb and Passover lamb. Jesus is the Passover lamb, the fulfillment of all of it. Or to borrow from Colossians chapter 2, you have all of the types and shadows anticipating. You've got the temple. You've got the priesthood. You've got all of these things happening in the Old Testament in anticipation. And now the substance, Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, the substance belongs to Christ. He is the one who didn't abolish, but he is the one who fulfills. In theology, we refer, refer to this sometimes as progressive revelation. History's going somewhere. Uh, uh, or preachers who try to pay attention to this and, and read the Old Testament in light of what Jesus is saying, they try to preach through the Old Testament in a way that's called redemptive historically paying attention that it's all moving somewhere and, and culminating in Christ. One commentator put it this way. This is a shocker for some. He who fulfills the law and the prophets displaces them insofar as he must become the center of attention. If he fulfills all of them by necessity, in a good way, not in a bad way, he displaces them from center stage because now Jesus is center stage. And now we're into controversy. Because some people think Christ-centered preaching is bad. I think Christ-centered preaching is good. I think Jesus thinks Christ-centered preaching is good too. He's all for the types and the shadows, all that came before. He's not against it, but he steps up and says, I fulfill them. I'm the one they were anticipating. Redemptive historical perspective. This is not replacement theology. This is fulfillment theology. Theology. 
maybe to give you a little bit of a break and maybe bring the controversy to a little bit of a point that might help you understand. A number of years ago, I was speaking at a conference at, it was in a different country, um, and I was giving a lecture or a talk, whatever it is, to pastors, and it was on Christ-centered preaching. And so the, the director of the conference, I had to send my notes ahead of time. Everything was approved. I wasn't there to create trouble or to stir up controversy. I'm there to help support the conference. I'm there to help pastors. Who wouldn't like Christ-centered preaching? You know, I'm thinking, of course, this is like kind of a no-brainer. I'm a Christian. We're Christians. We cr preach the Christian gospel. Christ-centered preaching is good, right? I was born yesterday is what I found out. So do my lecture, do my thing. We're taking a brief break. And as we're, we're um, trading spaces, as I'm taking my stuff down from the podium or lectern, and the next speaker is getting up uh, to speak, uh, a well-known Christian author in the biblical, biblical counseling movement, uh, he was so upset with me that he almost dropped his computer. I vividly remember. And he was so shaken and so angry. I think angry. I, I don't want to say what's not true, but he was so upset with me. And he said, what you're promoting here, what you're saying and promoting is redemptive historical preaching. And I thought, yeah. And I'm troubled because I'm not, I'm, you might think I'm a troublemaker, but I don't want to be a troublemaker. So I sat down and just wanted to listen. And then it made more sense. It made more sense because then it turned into what I'm going to call mining the Bible, mining the Old Testament for timeless truths and character studies. And it was all about this guy was bad, so don't do what he did when he was bad, but then he was good here, so do what he did when he was good here, and this woman was good here, and she was bad here. And so the whole thing was about changing your moral behavior based upon you trying to follow or not follow certain examples, and that's in essence what the Old Testament was about. Jesus didn't come to abolish but let's make sure we understand, Jesus came to fulfill. In anticipation, the whole thing is looking forward to him, the faithful son, the true son. If you've been taking the Isaiah class, you've been learning about, even in the book of Isaiah, you have Israel, the unfaithful son. Israel, the unfaithful son. Israel, the unfaithful son. And then you start to see that this nation becomes personified, like in chapter 42, for example, and further. And before you know it, the son is the son you're thinking of. And you get to Isaiah 53, and you know full well we're not talking about the nation. We're talking about the faithful son. Types and shadows looking forward to Christ. I'm fulfilling these things. I'm a fan of redemptive historical reading of the Bible and preaching of the Bible because in the, at the end of the day, Christ is center. Christ is the end game of the whole thing. Thank you for letting me get that off my chest. Number three, a third clarifying fact about Jesus that addresses the crisis of confusion of thinking is Jesus is pro-Old Testament. He's pro-Old Testament. I think we've already seen this, but we're really going to see it here, okay? He's not for unhinging from the Old Testament, like Andy Stanley said not long ago. He's pro-Old Testament. Verse 18, for truly, earnestly, seriously, truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not an iota, and since he's, he, that's a Greek word for the smallest letter, but since he's talking about the Old Testament, he's probably using that for, for, he's using a Greek word, but he's talking about an Old Testament word. He's talking about a little letter called a yod. Don't need to know that. But I'm just going to point out to the last time I checked, there are 66,420 yods in the Old Testament. I've never checked, but that's what experts tell us. Somebody counted. Some person who ought be locked in a soft padded room checked. And there are that, the little tiny Hebrew mark, 66,420 of them. The reason it's important is when Jesus says, not one of those little marks, not one of those seemingly unimportant marks. It's trivial. It's not a big deal. See the point? Not even one of those little marks. Then not a dot, not the slightest little marking. 
will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. And we're seeing Jesus is the one who accomplishes it. Hopefully you also noticed, he says, I say to you. So not the prophets, thus saith the Lord, or the apostles, it is written. He says, I say. But let's make sure we see that Jesus' view, Jesus' perspective of the validity, the truthfulness, the authenticity of the Old Testament law and prophets is really, really, really high. And unfortunately, again, sometimes Christians are all embarrassed by what God said in the Old Testament and somehow that was so lesser and it's not important. Well, I, I'm a Christian. So my view of the Bible needs to be the same as Christ's view of the Bible. I might not understand all of it. I might not understand the wisdom of it all. But the reality is I'm not ashamed of any of it because if it's God's word and, and I take it as I, my view of scripture is the same as Jesus' view of scripture, he's pro-Old Testament. He's pro-fulfilling it. He's not pro-wrong use of it. He's not pro-bad interpretations of it. But he for sure is pro-Old Testament. I want to I learn from that. The Apostle Paul, I think, would agree. 1 Timothy 1.8, the law is good. Let's move on to the next one. The fourth clarifying fact about Jesus that hopefully helps us to think rightly. Number four, Jesus is critical of law light. Jesus is critical of law light. Verse 19, this one's crucial and important. Therefore, whoever relaxes. So we saw how important even the little markings are. Jesus says, therefore, whoever relaxes, um, it's a word for loosens, uh, makes it less constricting. So whoever uh, makes it more comfortable, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. You don't get the sense he's saying, well, you know what? It's the spirit of the law that counts, not the letter. It's actually the exact opposite. He's, he's going not just for letters. He's going for marks. You don't, don't, don't promote law light. It, it needs to be there with all of the markings and letters. The letter of the law. Don't try to lessen it. It's strong. Notice the play on words again that he uses there. If you, if you relax one of the least of the commandments, you'll be called least. I think he's just making a simple point. Don't create a whole theology that there are people who have a lot in heaven and there are people who have a little in heaven. I don't think Jesus is selling nosebleed seats to heaven. Which tickets would you like? No, he's using words. He's saying, if you, t if you lessen even the least one, you know what, I'm gonna use a word for you. You're like that, you're least. Ultimately, you don't belong. But notice he's, he, he's anti-law light. And I think this is exactly what the Apostle Paul is up to when he's anti-law light. Romans chapter 10 is a crucial passage. The reason the Jews in his time don't come to believe in Jesus as Savior, one of the big reasons is because they create their own law that's lower, it's law light that they can scale if it were a wall. They can achieve its requirements. And the Apostle Paul says, oh, no, 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 no. What we need is the law with all the markings. We need not the spirit of the law, the letter of the law, because then what will happen? If you give law in its full strength, people are going to be desperate and they're going to see their need that they can't scale that law wall, if you will, and they'll look to the one who can and did. They'll look to Christ. So when we try to lessen God's requirements, Jesus doesn't make sense. When we lessen God's requirements, we can do it. God helps those who help themselves, pull yourself up by your spiritual bootstraps or whatever it might be. What we want is full orbed, full throttle, screws tightened, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. That's what Jesus says later in chapter five. And that is a whew, death blow spiritually and you say, I can't do it. It's exactly right. It's exactly right. So I'm not for preaching softer messages so people come to believe in Jesus. I want to preach stronger 
I'm not going to do it, but I, I, I would love to come on a Sunday morning and, or to a huge group of people whenever that happens and, and just go full throttle law. God requires that you are perfect and you obey his requirements perfectly and perpetually. You love him with heart, heart, soul, mind, and strength and you love your neighbor as yourself, including with right motives. And if not, you're going to hell and the angels will praise God for it because the wages of sin is death, condemnation. Have a nice day. Or something like that. Because the reality is, if you, re you relax the requirement, you'll never end up looking to Christ to be the one who saves his people from their sins. Romans 10, I referenced it, I didn't read it, but I, I, I must, I, I'm compelled. Romans 10, 2, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Romans 10, 3 says, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God, that's legal terminology, righteousness is adherence to law. They're ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, see they create their own scalable standards, they do not submit to God's righteousness, which would be, and we'll see in the context, provided through Christ. I find it so ironic that some people want to suggest that in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is the kinder, gentler Moses. He's the opposite of the kinder, gentler Moses. If anything, I don't think they're saying different things, but he's making it all together clear. Right? We're going to get into that later. You've heard it said, but I say to you. So then Jesus is going to, not only going to deal with the external actions, he's going to say, God actually is looking at the heart too. Not kinder, gentler. If anything, Jesus is not making it higher law. He's just blowing the spiritual dust off of it, if you will, to see God's intent all along is perfect, perpetual obedience. And nobody's going to make it. It's crucial that we get that. If we lower law, let's put it this way. If we, we add grace to law, and then we add law to gospel, we ruin both of them. And it happens all the time. Well, the law is, you know, God, God, God understands. And the gospel is, you know, you better contribute. We just ruin both of them. God requires absolute perfection. Creates guilt. We look to Christ for grace. We respond with gratitude. I suppose we should ask the question before we move on to the next one. We're on number four, the fourth clarifying fact. Who is this person who does the law anyway? When we look at the verse, the one who does will be called great. I think in context of the whole book, that's a really short line. I actually think he's speaking in principle. You want to use the fancier term? Principially. I just like to say it. Principially. Microsoft Word doesn't like it. Jesus, I think, is speaking principially, as in, you know, want to know who's great in heaven? the one who does perfectly and perpetually God's requirements. Well, that wouldn't make sense if that's you or me because Jesus came to save his people from their sins. Oh, by the way, 1 John says sin is unrighteousness. Sin is breaking God's requirements. So that brings us to the fifth clarifying fact about Jesus that addresses the crisis of confusion of thinking. Number five, Jesus is demanding of perfect righteousness. He's demanding of perfect righteousness. Verse 20, look there with me if you would. For I tell you, unless your righteousness, you can look it up in 10 different Greek dictionaries, righteousness, the word means adherence to law. Okay, it means adherence to law. It's a legal word. If you're, if you're justified, you're declared righteous, you're declared in, uh, a keeper of God's law. Okay, so if you have a phobia against legal things, you would never come to that conclusion about righteousness. But you can look it up. Righteousness is adherence to law. For I tell you, unless your righteousness, your adherence to God's requirements, exceeds that of the scribes. Those are 
law experts, and Pharisees, a different kind of law experts, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. I think that's true because Jesus says it, but it's not good news. It's just more law screw tightening because we need to see that we need to look to Jesus to be the one, not you, yourself, who saves his people from their sins. The scribes and the Pharisees are known for righteousness. Now I realize there's disagreement amongst Christians and some Christians are going to say they weren't righteous. It's wrong to think they were righteous. But they were known for being righteous. And later in Matthew's account, Jesus will bust their spiritual chops for, for not doing certain things. But he acknowledges that they do certain things that God's law requires, which is what we call righteousness. So in Matthew 23, we won't turn there, but in Matthew 23, they do tithe, mint, and dill, and cumin, which is what God requires to the point where Jesus says, these you ought to have done. So at least in part, they're doing what they ought to do. They're obeying God's law. They're doing righteousness. Now again, he's going he's to blast them for, for not doing other things they need to do. And, and, and so, but some, something's missing is the point. But it would be a mistake to think they don't do anything right. Again, I'll quote from the Reformation Study Bible, uh, not because it's inspired, but because I don't want you to think I'm the only one who believes like I believe. Jesus does not criticize the Pharisees for their strict observance of the law, but for their emphasis on outward conformity to it without a proper inner attitude. And I think that's, that's right. I mean, we're dealing with the God who summarizes his whole law by saying, love me with heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. But heart, soul, mind, and strength, all of your faculties, including your motives, heart, perfect obedience, externally, yes, but also internally. And the Pharisees don't have it. But Jesus shows up and says, unless your righteousness is better than theirs, and they're the kings of righteousness. They put on righteousness concerts and show you how to do it. Unless yours is far better than theirs. And he, Jesus actually uses two words in our text. Uh, they, they can be um, summarized. It's, it's in one word, exceeds, but qualitatively and quantitatively. Unless your Righteousness, adherence to God's law is quantitatively and qualitatively better than the rock stars of righteousness, you don't go to heaven. Again. Whew. Stab in the chest spiritually. Not good news. True. But not good news. Something more is required. And to remove any doubt as to the issue, I, I did reference it earlier, but I'll reference it again. Matthew 5.48 says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. I, I don't know how you're going to get around that. What does God require? What's the huge crisis? The crisis of thought is to not know what God requires. Well, what God requires is penance. What God requires is I'm better than my neighbor because I've seen, I've seen them do bad things. What God requires... What God requires is perfect, perpetual, including motive obedience to his requirement. And if we want to summarize it, we can say loving God perfectly, loving neighbor appropriately all the time. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Everybody who wants to go to heaven, get in that line. Just make sure you're not a phony. Nobody's going to be in that line. Unless we're reading Matthew in context, 121, he came to save his people from their sins. Aha! Now we're on to something in context. It's him. The Apostle Paul would certainly agree with this where he says in Romans chapter 3 verse 10, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. You better have perfect righteousness to get to heaven, Jesus says. The Apostle Paul commenting, clarif not, not clarifying, complimenting, there's none righteous, no, not one. Huh, not good news. 
really important, really true. We're going to go to the last point. I have more on my notes, but I, I got a text this morning from a friend who said, preach long today, brother. Um, but we'll, go on, we'll, we'll move on to number six. Jesus is your only hope. Jesus is your only hope is the sixth clarifying fact about Jesus addressing the crisis of confusion of thought. Jesus is your only hope. Again, I already let the cat out of the bag and reference Matthew one twenty one, But we could look elsewhere and beyond this text to know that Jesus is God's gift to us of perfect righteousness. That's why we look not to ourselves, we look to Christ. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 9, it's a classic text. To be found in Christ, in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. And the Pharisees were the best at that, I might add. But that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God. See, it's a gift that depends upon faith. And in the context, it's faith in Christ. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 is an excellent passage as well. We typically quote the beginning of it and we forget the latter part of it. I'll quote the whole thing so you can appreciate it. My little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He's the perfect upholder of God's legal requirements. And so don't sin, Christian. But if you do, you got to know that God has accepted you as if you were a perfect upholder of God's requirements because it's Jesus Christ, the righteous, who's your advocate. Matthew 3.15, we referenced earlier as well. Jesus came to do all that he did. It's why he obeyed John the Baptist's call to repent even though he didn't need to repent because he said, it's fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. He did everything that God was requiring requiring of the people to obey. I want to end with an illustration of these things that encourage us to look to Christ. So God requires perfection. Don't think wrongly about that. That's going to help you to think it's appropriate to look to Christ for acceptance from God to gain entrance to heaven. When I was in seventh grade and up to no good, I was in science class with my friend Mike. Let's call him Mike Anderson because that was his name. So Mike Anderson and I are sitting in the back of the room at high tables in science class and we're watching some boring video and we're talking and laughing and trying to get other kids to laugh and these girls to laugh and we're causing no small amount of trouble. And Mr. Monroe, our teacher, Mr. Monroe who had a certain kind of accent from a different country and could be pretty stern, he said, Pat, Mike, in the office. And we thought, oh, great. You know, busted. We're going to the principal's office. and (sighs) So we walk into Mr. Monroe's office in between these two classrooms, and he closed the door and looked at us, and he said, someone brought me a cake. Eat all you want, wipe your faces off, and go sit back in class. It was awesome. It was awesome. We were rewarded, right? We were given a gracious gift, even though we deserved to be condemned. And you know why? Because Mike Anderson and Pat Abendroff were closest of friends with Eric Monroe, the son of Roland Monroe, Mr. Monroe. It's not a perfect illustration. But my point is, we gain acceptance from God. Even though we deserve condemnation, he gives us the gift that we don't deserve. Okay? He doesn't just give us zero. He gives us this great, wonderful gift. And he does so not based upon our merits, not based upon our virtues, but based upon the virtue of the fact that we are related to his son who he is pleased with. And so we receive all of the good gifts because of the Son by the Father. And again, the the illustration breaks down on lots of levels. But on a certain level, you can appreciate Jesus is the perfect, faithful Son who fulfills all righteousness. And we belong to Him 
And if we belong to him by faith, we're guaranteed heaven. We've got to remember that. We've got to think rightly about who Jesus is and what he did. But that also assumes we think rightly about what God requires. Perfect, perpetual obedience. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you won't enter heaven. Bad news for sinners. Look to Christ who fulfilled all righteousness. Good news for sinners who believe in Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning and thank you for the fact that we have an opportunity to look to your word together, to hear from the Lord Jesus Christ, to acknowledge that not only did a crisis exist back then, a a theological crisis, a thinking crisis, but certainly it plagues us, it plagues our society, it plagues our culture, it plagues the human race. And so may many men and women and boys and girls see the desperation of their position and trust in your son, Jesus. Please sustain us as your people. Help us to seek opportunities to boast in Christ and not in ourselves. Thank you so much for the promise of eternal life that will transcend anything in the here and now. In Jesus' name, amen.